Time to cover anti-tank tactics and principles. For this I took a look at the War Department's Field Manual 735 from March 1944. That covers the anti-tank company and other anti-tank units in the US Army Infantry Regiment. So let's examine the anti-tank company before we dive into the overall defensive setup, tactics and how to properly deploy a defensive position with anti-tank mines. An US Army anti-tank company of an infantry regiment consists of a company headquarters, three anti-tank platoons and an anti-tank mine platoon. The company headquarters had 35 men, each anti-tank platoon 33 men and the anti-tank man platoon 31 men. In terms of equipment, the headquarters company had two jeeps, two 0.75 ton weapons carrier and a 1.5 ton cargo truck. Each anti-tank platoon had one jeep, a 50 cal machine gun, three trucks, three anti-tank guns with 57 millimeters and three bazookas. The anti-tank mine platoon had one jeep and two trucks. So let's take a look at the whole company. In total, the anti-tank company had 165 men, 9 anti-tank guns, 9 bazookas and lots of other stuff. Note that the anti-tank company was part of the infantry regiment, which also consists of 3 infantry battalions, which themselves had their own organic anti-tank units, namely an anti-tank platoon each. Now these battalions had their own assigned areas of defense, which were themselves located in the regimental zone. Thus the regimental anti-tank company was used to support the anti-tank units of the battalions. As stated in the field manual, frequently one platoon of the regimental anti-tank company is employed to reinforce or add depth to the anti-mechanized defenses of each frontline battalion and provide protection to its flanks. Hence the main function of the anti-tank company was to provide protection against enemy tanks in coordination with the battalion's anti-tank platoons. To achieve this, the primary missions were reinforcing the frontline battalions to deepen the anti-tank defenses and to protect the flank or rear of the regiment. Secondary missions were the attacking of enemy observation posts, fortification, gun emplacements or other enemy positions. Note that if during a secondary mission a primary mission appeared, the anti-tank units should switch without order to the primary mission, meaning engaging the enemy armored or mechanized troops. Now something about the, how the defense was organized. There were three firing positions, the primary, the supplementary and the alternate position. Whereas the primary firing position is defined as follows. The primary firing position is the position from which the gun can best execute its primary mission. So let's take a look at the specific situation. For instance, this could be covering an approach. Now since there are usually more approaches to cover, Supplementary positions were necessary. A supplementary position is a position that can cover an area that can't be covered by a primary position. An alternate firing position is an additional position to a primary or supplementary position that covers the same area and thus can conduct the same fire mission. This alternate position allows to perform the mission even if the respective primary or supplementary position is under fire. It must be reachable with the gun taught by its crew, yet far enough to avoid being affected by direct fire at the primary position. Additionally, there were cover positions near the firing positions to provide protection for personnel and equipment not engaged with the enemy. Now if you should ever set up an anti-tank position on your property or somewhere else, the manual contained two interesting bits that were quite interesting. First off, during the excavation of the position, you should employ a camouflage net to avoid detection from the air. But as always, the devil is in the details. When you use a camo net, be sure that it touches the ground everywhere. Because if it doesn't, it will grow a large shadow that makes it quite visible from the air. And second, after firing your gun several times, you should consider removing the blast marks in front of your gun. Now for better coordination and organization, usually each unit was assigned a sector of responsibility. The size was dependent on terrain, visibility and proximity of additional units. Ideally these sectors should overlap with the sectors of the adjacent units. The unit leader was responsible for observing the assigned area. In order to provide effective fire and prevent giving away the position too early, there were several rules in place. First, the unit leader defined the ranges at which the enemy vehicles should be engaged. Second, approaching hostile recon and decoy vehicles should not be fired upon 
unless the superior commander ordered this explicitly. For example, for an anti-tank platoon the company commander and if the platoon was attached to a battalion the battalion commander. This prevented giving away the position of the guns prematurely and furthermore the enemy should only be engaged when he had committed his main force. In order to provide proper ranges, the squad leader for each gun was responsible creating a reference sheet which he also copied for the platoon leader. Let's take a short look at an adaptive version of the range card contained in the field manual. Now such a reference sheet was rather simple, it contained the position of the gun, an indicator for the magnetic north and various reference points with names and distance from the gun. Let's take a closer look at the defensive organization and tactics of the anti-tank units. The field manual has quite an interesting view on defensive combat stated under the point defensive doctrines. The general object of defensive combat is to gain time pending the development of more favorable conditions for undertaking the offensive or to economize forces on one front for the purpose of concentrating superior forces for a decision elsewhere. As you can clearly see the defense is seen as a temporary situation until an offensive is possible or as a deliberate action in one area to provide the necessary forces for an attack in another area. Thus on a strategic scale an offensive stance seems to be the determining factor. Now one element in discussions about anti-tank operations that is often commonly neglected is the usage of mines. When defending an area against tanks, mines can play a crucial part, yet mines are often misunderstood. The most important thing about mines is that they are first and foremost an area denial weapon. This means that the enemy should be discouraged to use the mined areas and thus divert his approach into an area that is chosen by the defending side which should allow an effective usage of anti-tank guns and other weapons. Now minefields don't stop a professional army. The manual stated that minefields must be laid in small arms range of an organized position. Furthermore, a minefield must be defended by fire to be effective. Undefended minefields delay the enemy only for a relatively short time. It takes to bypass them or to remove enough mines to permit passage. Besides funneling the enemy attack into certain areas, mines should also be used to increase the resistance of outposts. By properly mining the approaches of an outpost, the defending units could withdraw and lower the chances of being overrun. Furthermore, in case of a breakthrough, a properly mined regimental sector would prevent the enemy tanks from moving freely and thus denying them to fully exploit their advantage. Finally, let's take a look at an example position that uses mines and roadblocks to defend an area. The roadblock is covered by the gun and also small arms fire from the infantry. The gun is positioned that it can cover the road and other approaches suitable for tanks. The mines are in range of small arms fire to prevent their removal. Furthermore, the infantry also protects the gun from enemy infantry. Additionally, rocket teams nearby provide additional protection from attacks on the flanks and rear. Furthermore, if during an attack a tank comes within or below a range of 270 meters, all personnel not serving the gun or already attacking enemy foot troops should employ rockets or other weapons against the enemy tanks. To summarize, each battalion defended its sector with their organic anti-tank defenses, whereas the regimental anti-tank company provided additional protection on the flanks and or death. Use of anti-tank mines, natural and artificial obstacles was central in settling up a proper defense. In case of an enemy attack it was important to wait until the enemy committed its main force. Additionally, firing at lone recon vehicles was performed only in accordance with the commander the anti-tank unit was attached to. These measures ensured that the positions weren't given away prematurely and that the maximum firepower could be used once the enemy reached an effective firing range. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share and subscribe. And see you next time.